Sabbath School Quarterly, 2023, Second Quarter, Lesson 3. Who shall be able to stand? For Sabbath, April 15. Memory text. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, verse 13. Quote, One of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths revealed in the Bible is that of Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption. The doctrine of the second advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. The Great Controversy, page 299. Suggested reading. The Great Controversy, pages 635 to 652. Sunday. A Literal Return. Question A. Name the most blessed promise in the scripture. John 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14, verses 1 through 3, and 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Quote, The coming of the Lord has been in all ages the hope of his true followers. The Savior's parting promise upon all of it that He would come again lighted up the future for His disciples, filling their hearts with joy and hope that sorrow could not quench nor trials dim. Amid suffering and persecution, the appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ was the blessed hope. When the Thessalonian Christians were filled with grief as they buried their loved ones who had hoped to live to witness the coming of the Lord, Paul, their teacher, pointed them to the resurrection to take place at the Savior's advent. Great Controversy, page 302. Question B. Why are the details in the prophecies of Christ's return so important? Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, verse 28. Quote, the doctrine of the world's conversion and the spiritual reign of Christ was not held by the apostolic church. It was not generally accepted by Christians until about the beginning of the 18th century. Like every other error, its results were evil. It induced a feeling of confidence and security that was not well founded and led many to neglect the preparation necessary in order to meet their Lord. Great Controversy, pages 321 and 322. Monday. Literal and visible. Question A. In what manner will Jesus come again? Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Acts 1, verses 9-11 through 11. Quote, The promise of Christ's second coming was ever to be kept fresh in the minds of his disciples. The same Jesus, whom they had seen ascending into heaven, would come again, to take to himself those who here below give themselves to his service. The same voice that had said to them, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end, would bid them 
welcome to His presence in the heavenly kingdom. Acts the Apostles, page 33. Quote, Precious indeed was the promise to those sorrowing disciples that they should again see who was greatly beloved by them all. Precious also is the promise to every true follower of Christ. None who truly love Jesus will be sorry that He is coming again. Jesus is coming as He ascended into heaven, only with additional splendor. He is coming with the glory of His Father and all the holy angels with Him to escort Him on His way. Instead of the cruel crown of thorns to pierce His holy temples, a crown of dazzling glory will deck His sacred brow. He will not wear a plain, seamless coat, but a garment whiter than snow, of dazzling brightness. Jesus is coming, but not to reign as a temporal prince. He will raise the righteous dead, change the living saints to a glorious immortality, and with the saints take the kingdom under the whole heaven. The Faith I Live By, page 351. Question B. Does this mean that Jesus resurrected in his actual body? John 2, verses 19-21 through Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. John 2, verses 19-21 through Quote, After the resurrection, the priests and rulers circulated the report that Christ did not die upon the cross, that he merely fainted and was afterward revived. Another report affirmed that it was not a real body of flesh and bone, but the likeness of a body that was laid in the tomb. The action of the Roman soldiers disproves these falsehoods. They broke not his legs because he was already dead. To satisfy the priest, they pierced his side. Had not life been already extinct, this would have caused instant death. Desire of Ages, page 772. Quote, after his resurrection, he tarried on earth for a season, that his disciples might become familiar with him in his risen and glorified body. Now he was ready for the leave-taking. He had authenticated the fact that he was a living Savior. His disciples need no longer associate him with the tomb. They could think of him as glorified before the heavenly universe. The Desire of Ages, page 829. Tuesday. His glorious appearing. Describe the literal return of Jesus Christ from heaven. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Matthew 25, verse 31. Quote, No language can describe the glory of the scene. The living cloud of majesty and unsurpassed glory came still nearer, and we could clearly behold the lovely person of Jesus. He did not wear a crown of thorns, but a crown of glory rested upon his holy brow. Upon his vesture and thigh was a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. His countenance was as bright as the noonday sun. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet had the appearance of fine brass. His voice sounded like many musical instruments. The earth trembled before him, the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of its places. Early Writings, pages 286 and 287. Question B. How many of the living inhabitants of earth will not be able to recognize such a coming? Matthew 24, verses 24 through 27. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, verses 24-27 through 27. Revelation 1, verse 7 Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1, verse 7. Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us 
from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. Quote, Terribly will that prayer be fulfilled in the great judgment day, when Christ shall come to the earth again, not as a prisoner, surrounded by a rabble, will men see him. They will see him as heaven's king. Christ will come in his own glory, in the glory of his Father, and the glory of the holy angels, ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands of angels, the beautiful and triumphant sons of God, possessing surpassing loveliness and glory, will escort him on his way. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Then every eye shall see him, and they also that pierced him. In the place of a crown of thorns he will wear a crown of glory, a crown within a crown. In place of that old purple kingly robe, he will be clothed in raiment of whitest white, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Mark 9, verse 3. And on his vesture and on his thigh a name will be written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19, verse 16. Those who mocked and smote him will be there. The priests and rulers will behold again the scene in the judgment hall. Every circumstance will appear before them, as if written in letters of fire. Then those who prayed, His blood be on us and on our children, will receive the answer to their prayer. Then the whole world will know and understand. They will realize who and what they poor, feeble, finite beings have been warring against. In awful agony and horror, they will cry to the mountains and rocks. Revelation 16, verses 16 and 17 quoted. The Desire of Ages, pages 739 and 740. Wednesday, the purpose of his coming. Question A. What is the main purpose of Jesus coming again? Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Matthew 16, verse 27. Quote, in his divine arrangement, through his unmerited favor, the Lord has ordained that good works shall be rewarded. We are accepted through Christ's merit alone, and the acts of mercy, the deeds of charity which we perform, are the fruits of faith, and they become a blessing to us, for men are to be rewarded according to their works. It is the fragrance of the merit of Christ that makes our good works acceptable to God, and it is grace that enables us to do the works for which He rewards us. Our works in and of themselves have no merit. When we have done all that it is possible for us to do, we are to count ourselves as unprofitable servants. We deserve no thanks from God. We have only done what it was our duty to do, and our works could not have been performed in the strength of our own sinful natures. B.C., Volume 5, page 1122. Question B. What about those who have died in the hope of seeing Jesus return? 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. First Thessalonians 4 Verses 13 to 18. Quote, As Paul's epistle was opened and read, great joy and consolation was brought to the church by the words revealing the true state of the dead. Paul showed that those living when Christ should come would not go to meet their Lord in advance of those who had fallen asleep in Jesus. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God would reach the sleeping ones, and the dead in Christ should rise first before the touch of immortality should be given to the living. Acts of the Apostles, page 258. Question C. What happens to the unrepentant? Mark 8, verse 38. 
Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Mark 8, verse 38. Revelation 6, verses 14 through 17. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island removed out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6, verses 14-17 through 17. Quote, In the lives of all who reject truth there are moments when conscience awakens, when memory presents the torturing recollection of a life of hypocrisy, and the soul is harassed with vain regrets. But what are these compared with the remorse of that day, when fear cometh as a desolation, when destruction cometh as a whirlwind? Proverbs 1 verse 27. Those who would have destroyed Christ and his faithful people now witness the glory which rests upon them. Great Controversy, page 644. Thursday. Readiness. Question A. In order to be prepared to witness these final events in a state of readiness, what type of character is necessary? First John 2, verse 8. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. First John 2, verse 28. First John 3, verses 1-9. through 9. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. 1 John 3, verses 1-9 through nine. Quote, Righteousness has its root in godliness. No human being is righteous any longer than he has faith in God and maintains a vital connection with him. As the flower of the field has its roots in the soil, as it must receive air, dew, showers, and sunshine, so must we receive from God that which ministers to the life of the soul. It is only through becoming partakers of his nature that we receive power to obey his commandments. No man, high or low, experienced or inexperienced, can steadily maintain before his fellow men a pure, forceful life unless his life is hid with Christ in God. The greater the activity among men, the closer should be the communion of the heart with God. 70, page 194. Question B. What are all who are waiting for Christ's return to be doing? Mark 13, verses 35-37 through 37. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Mark 13, verses 35-37 through 37. James 5, verses 7 and 8 Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, 
for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. James 5, verses 7 and 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 6. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. First Thessalonians 5, verses 1-6 through six. Quote, Because time is short, we should work with diligence and double energy. Watch and pray is an injunction often repeated in the scriptures. In the lives of those who obey this injunction, there will be an undercurrent of happiness that will bless all with whom they are brought in contact. Those who are sour and cross in disposition will become sweet and gentle. Those who are proud will become meek and lowly. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 293. Friday, April 14. Personal Review Questions Question 1. What has been the continuous hope of all believers since the time our first parents were expelled from the Garden of Eden? Question 2. How do we know that Christ's coming is literal? Question 3. Of those living on earth, who will actually be able to see His return? Question 4. Why is Jesus coming again? Question 5. How are you getting ready to see Jesus? Jesus.